too many of our churches are building on law as the foundation of their culture instead of grace. Whenever you start with law as the foundation, it will always lead to comparison, which will always create a false pecking order that is rooted on a satanic lie about your true identity. If we accept the demonic counterfeit and we build our lives on law, we will be trapped on a treadmill of performance for the rest of our lives. And that treadmill of performance is guaranteed to wear you out. Grace gives, gives us a different perspective on life. And in these ways, grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and establishes a surer foundation for righteous living than the law does. Well, this is session two, uh, I'm sorry, this is session three uh, of course one, and this is understanding grace versus law. And I'll start with a uh, story about sheep and, and uh, the shepherd. And you stop to think about this, the Bible often says that, you know, Jesus is the shepherd and we are like sheep and the devil is a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And so I'm thinking about it this way, if I am a sheep, and there is a lion that is hunting me and wants to eat me for lunch, what is my best defense? Is it for me to learn sheep taekwondo? Oh, you know, <laughs> I will. No, is, is, is it for me to like, you know, lift a lot of weights and get super strong? The, no, is it the Bible never asks us to become super sheep, does it? Right? The Bible doesn't say, you know, it's up to you to be strong. It's up to you to be all this. The Bible says, no, it's up to you to stay close to the shepherd. And so our best defense against the enemy is to stay as close to the shepherd as possible. And again, this is the same principle we talked about last night about having a big connection, you know, the vine and the branches and having a big connection is, is the key to an abundant life. Well, Satan knows this. And so this roaring lion is unique and that this roaring lion is also the father of lies. And so his primary mo mode of attack is to use deception to convince the sheep not to stay close to the shepherd. So what kind of deception might induce a sheep to stay away from the shepherd? Well, I find that he has two primary attacks here, and I'm not the only one. I read years ago when I was in seminary, we read uh, Calvin's Institutes. You know, John Calvin, uh, the founder of the Reformed uh, branch of Protestantism. And uh, Calvin starts off his institute by saying, it really doesn't matter whether you begin with a study of God or whether you begin with a study of man, because one will inevitably lead you to the other. And his point being, you can't understand yourself except as a creation of God and someone made in his image and likeness. And you can't really understand God apart from his love for you, his desire to save, you know, his initiation of, uh, of sending his son into this world. And uh, that's true. It's like our, our, our image of ourselves, our image of God, the uh, concepts of, of God and ourselves are like two sides of a coin. And so what happens is that you know, the lion over here, to kind of mix metaphors, you might almost think of uh, Satan as an archer. And John Eldridge kind of popularized this imagery of, of him as an archer shooting an arrow that pierces our hearts. And when his arrow pierces our hearts, it's like it goes through here, but it goes through both sides at the same time. And that one wound will inevitably influence our view of ourselves and our view of God. And as a result, to go kind of go back to the sheep analogy, let's say that the sheep starts to have uh, doubts about the shepherd. It says, well, you know, this bad thing happened to me. I don't know if I can trust the shepherd to take care of me. If I, you know, maybe the shepherd isn't uh, as, as strong and powerful as I thought he was, or maybe the shepherd isn't as good as I thought that he was. You know, what's, uh, what can I really trust? And they say, maybe I need to take care of myself. And so, the, the, the sheep will, can begin to believe lies about the shepherd and it will cause them to kind of keep their distance. And this is very common in the Christian faith. There's a lot of us and that, is, that have uh, faith in God for big things. Like we have faith in God to go into missions work or we have faith in God to raise funds for a new building. But when it comes to having faith in God for the wounded places in our hearts, that's a different story. Because when it comes to trusting God in the wounded places in our heart, that's the one part of us that has learned not to trust. And so the, uh, the devil knows this. He wants to use his lies to get us to, to not trust the shepherd so we'll stay away from him. 
but equally as effective is to get us to believe lies about ourselves. If I am a, a sheep and I start to thinking, you know what, I am such a bad sheep. I wander away, you know, I eat stuff that's not good for me. I, uh, I do things I'm not supposed to do. I bet the shepherd's sick of me. You know, the shepherd probably doesn't want me around. Well, that would equally be an effective way to get us separated from, from the shepherd, wouldn't it? And it has multiple effects. One is it makes us easy lunch for the enemy. And two, it keeps us from establishing that really big connection with God that we need in order for the life of the Spirit to flow through us so that we can experience that abundant, victorious life. The, uh, several years ago, I uh, read a book by a, a counselor up in Minnesota called William, named William Backus. And the name of his book was The Hidden Rift with God. The Hidden Rift with God. And his thesis in this book was that most Christians are secretly angry with God about something. And he says they are secretly angry with God about something because they want to be good Christians and they know that good Christians don't get mad at God. <laughs> and since good Christians don't get mad at God, we just kind of live in denial about this anger that we have that this good and loving God has let these bad things happen to us in our lives. And so what happens is, is, is again, this is classically that we have been wounded in this fallen world, often the wound orchestrated by the enemy who wants to take us out of this battle before we can, can become a threat to him. And God wants to restore that relationship. And so what we have here again is, is, is a, a model here that says that what's going on in our minds is extremely important to our walk with God. There is a battle going on for your mind. And this battle is between, you know, the father of lies and the spirit of truth to see who's going to be able to form the conception of God that will drive your life. Now, I mentioned before that I had a, a legalistic upbringing and it, it manifested itself in different ways. I can remember one night kneeling down to pray. And uh, as I closed my eyes to, to pray to God, it was like two images focused in my head, emerged in my head. One was, you know, the theater masks of comedy and tragedy where one's happy and the other one's crying. Well, in my mind, there was one mask that was happy and the other one was angry. And it was like, and, in my, and I remember thinking to myself, okay, God, which one are you tonight? Are you happy with me or are you angry with me? Now, what would cause me to ask that question? What caused me to ask that question was that I had a mental image in my mind of God as, and, and of my relationship to God as being based on my performance. That if I had done a good, you know, if I had done well that day, then God would be happy with me and, and he'd want to hear me praying. But if I had not done well that day, if I had messed up, you know, then he wouldn't be that happy and he, you know, be, you know, he'd be thinking things like, well, I'm not going to talk to you till you deal with this. And so I was constantly unsure of whether or not God really liked me. <laughs> I didn't know if God wanted me to talk to him or not, because I never knew if you know, something I had done had been displeasing to him. And that kind of mindset and those attached from the enemy, what they do is they cause me to not want to talk to God, right? They, they, they are an impetus away from God, away from relationship. And so I would avoid praying and avoid going to the Lord until I felt like I'd been doing really well. <laughs> You know, I mentioned the other day that I did a lot of Bible memory, so sometimes if I wasn't feeling good about myself, I'd go memorize some more passages of Scripture. But what I was really doing was trying to earn God's, you know, good favor towards me by saying, look what I did. You know, are you happy with me now? <laughs> because of this uncertainty of not knowing, you know, where I stood with Him because I did not have a grace perspective. I had a law perspective on uh, the way that I approached my Christianity. And I say all this in past tense, even though I understand it in my head, it's still something I struggle with, you know, uh, from time to time and have to uh, work through it different ways. So to understand this battle for the mind, there's a, a core principle here that says that how we live flows out of what we believe. So if I believe that God isn't happy with me because I haven't performed well, or if I believe that God had, you know, can't be trusted because he doesn't always stop bad things from happening. That mental, it's going to form a mental image in my mind. Just to give you a kind of a taste of the power of these mental ideas. I heard a story several years ago about a guy who uh, lowered his golf score by 20 strokes without ever touching a club in seven years. 
Right? So he never picked up a golf club for seven years, and yet in that time, he lo- bettered his score by 20 strokes. Do you know what his secret was? <laughs> he was a prisoner of war in Vietnam. He was being kept in solitary confinement all that time, and to try to keep his sanity, one of the things he learned to do was to play a, a round of golf in his head every day. And he would picture himself in all kinds of conditions on all of his favorite golf courses, and he'd play 18 holes of golf every day in his mind, swinging the club perfectly, using great technique every time. And after rehearsing the proper way of golfing in his mind for seven years, the next time when he was finally released and finally came home and went out to golf for the next time, he went from shooting in the mid-90s to the mid-70s without having ever uh, picked up a club. Now... (laughs) This is, this is really key, and one of the things this is really key is because the images in our mind and what controls our thinking is going to control the way that we live. We see this in, in, in our relationships a lot, too. Um, when I have the opportunity to do um, marriage counseling with people who want to come in and talk about what's going on in their marriages, one of the things I almost always do is, ask, is have them ask the Lord, would you show me two things? Would you show me right now what in words or pictures, how Satan's trying to get me to see my, my wife or my husband. So if it's a woman, I say, well, let's just ask. And I don't do it with the husband in the room, right? We'll just, if it's just the wife there, would you show me in words or pictures how Satan is trying to get me to see my husband? I've had some interesting responses. And one lady said, well, I see a ball and chain. It's like, well, what does that mean to you? It means, well, he's just stuck there not doing anything. And I feel like I want to fly and he's holding me back. And another lady say, oh, I see fangs, right? He's just a monster, you know? And this is a guy she caught doing pornography on the internet on several occasions and, and uh, things like this. And then we'd ask another question, say, well, okay, we got that response when we asked the Lord to show you what Satan was trying to tell you about your husband. Let's ask uh, the Lord what he wants you to know and see about your husband. And so the... Uh, in both cases, what was interesting is in both cases the, that I just shared with you, the lady said, I see a little boy who could never make his dad happy, you know, who hasn't, you know, he's a man in, a, in his body, but he's a little boy inside and he's lost. Now, here's the difference. <clears throat> what is your emotional reaction to a monster? What is your emotional reaction to a ball and chain? What is your life strategy in dealing with them? Versus, what is your emotion towards somebody who's broken and hurting and, and, and just a little boy inside who needs to grow up? What's your emotional reaction to that? And what is your strategy to helping them? It's night and day, isn't it? And that's partly what happened was that Satan knows that if he can control that image in our mind, we will respond emotionally to that image. We will respond in our behavior to that image or the image of ourselves. We did this exercise in, in, in one uh, place and a lady slipped me a note afterwards and she said, I asked the Lord to show me what lie Satan was telling me about me. And uh, <laughs> I saw myself dressed like a harlot, you know, underneath a, in the blue light district. I'm like, wow, that's pretty vivid. <laughs> she goes, yeah. I said, well, did you ask God how he saw you? She said, no. <laughs> I said, Maybe you should do that now. <laughs> so she did. She came up after the next session. He said, you'll never believe this. I saw myself dressed in white and dancing with Jesus. He'd forgiven me completely for these other things. Now, can you imagine which of these, if, which image is dominating your thought life is going to control how you feel about yourself, which is going to control how you act, which is going to control your desire to be with God? Because, you know, if you think you're a harlot, do you think God wants to be with you? No, no, but if you see yourself as, you know, forgiven, dressed in white, and Jesus wants to dance with you, that's a little more incentive to want to be close to the shepherd. And so we see that, that these things are, are, are critical. So going back to our analogy about the well, we said the well, there are four parts to heart-focused discipleship. There's, you know, grace in the spirit, and there's baggage and bondage. Well, tonight we want to focus on grace, laying a solid grace foundation. And the reason this is so important is that is that our, our concept of ourselves and our concept of our relationship with God is either going to be rooted in one or the other. It will either be rooted in law or it will be rooted in grace. If it is rooted in law, then you're going to be like me. You're always going to be wondering if you were good enough for God to want to pay attention to you. You're always going to be wondering if you performed well enough for God to uh, accept you. 
But if we have a grace foundation, we realize that all of this has already been provided for us by Christ. So let me give you a quick definition of grace. And uh, this isn't meant to be a universal definition. It covers all things. But when I'm talking about grace, this is what I, what I mean. Grace is all the blessings given to us because of atonement. All right, it is all the blessings given to us because of atonement. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 says, Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Well, how do we get every spiritual blessing in Christ that is given to us? Well, the answer is because it is ours because of what Christ did for us on the cross. When Christ died on the cross, his final word in Greek was tetelestai, which is, it is finished. And that means that the work that God gave him to do was finished. And on the, on the cross, he made atonement, not just to pay the penalty for our sins, but atonement purchased for us every blessing that God wanted to give us. So you can think of it as a payment on the cross, that he made a payment that purchased for us every spiritual blessing that God wanted for us, and now they all become ours in Christ. So you can think of it this way. In the Old Testament, People used to bring a sheep or a goat or something like this to the uh, temple. A priest would, you know, kill it, put it on the altar. And the book of Leviticus tells us numerous times that when people did this, that God would forgive them for their sin. All right? Do this and you will be forgiven. So I'm trying to understand this, you know, because Hebrews says the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. So why did God say, if you do this, you will be forgiven? Well, I understand it kind of this way. Have you ever used a credit card? Some of you use it more than others, I'm sure. <laughs> but the, uh, let me ask you a question. If you, uh, if, you, if you go to a restaurant and you pay with a credit card, they say, thank you, here's your food, and give it to you? Yeah. Does your credit card actually pay for the meal? You're still going to have to pay for that later, aren't you? <laughs> Right? You're going to get a bill in the mail someday later saying, hey, by the way, uh, you didn't actually pay for that yet. You still have to pay for it now. Well, that's kind of what was happening in the Old Testament when they would bring these, these uh, bulls and goats and sheep for uh, sacrifice is they were like Old Testament credit cards. <laughs> and that is that God received it as adequate payment and he gave them forgiveness. But someday the, the, the day was still yet to come when actual payment would be made. And so when Jesus Christ died on the cross and he made atonement, what he did is he's paying off all those credit cards and not only all those, but all of ours. And he just paid off the debt for everybody. And not only did he pay off the debt, but we're told that the righteousness of Christ became ours. So that's sort of like he made a deposit into our bank account of all, the, uh, all that was ever going to be necessary to cover any sin that we ever had. So here's the question. If Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, how many sins do you suppose that is? Well, we have, what, 7 billion people in the world today, something like that. So if everybody sins, let's say once a day, <laughs> I can't do the math. That's a lot of sin, right? So we're up in the trillions and trillions of sins that Jesus died for. So let me ask you a question. How many people here have sinned trillions and trillions of times? <laughs> no, not really. Honestly, we haven't sinned that many times. Uh, the, uh, my point here is that there is no way that you can sin so much that it's even a drop in the bucket to what Christ paid for on the cross when he made atonement for the sins of the whole world. It says no matter how much you sin, that grace has already been adequate to cover that. And that's why there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, that that has been completely paid for. So the grace is rooted in the atoning work that Christ made on the cross, and it is that atonement that purchased for us every spiritual blessing in Christ. Now, in our next session, I'm going to go into a little more detail on what those blessings are. For right now, I'm going to keep pressing through here on the difference between law and grace. Now, let's understand law. One way to understand law is I sometimes picture it this way. Like, here's Moses with a stone tablet over his head. And uh, he takes, he's got one stone tablet, and he sticks it in the ground here. He takes the other stone tablet, and he drags it along the ground. He draws a line in the stand, sticks the stone tablet down, and then he picks up the other one and just stands there. And now there's a line in the sand, and he's just standing there waiting. And what does the law do to anybody who crosses the line? Bam! <laughs> guilty. Bam! Guilty. In fact, that's the only thing the law can do, isn't it? The only thing the law can do is draw a line in the sand and then condemn you when you cross it. 
The law has no ability to keep us from crossing the line. It's got no ability to you know, justify us for these things. We can be forgiven under the law, but as we saw, just saw, it's basically a credit card payment that's still going to have to be paid someday. So the law draws a line in the sand, dares us to cross over it, and, the, and what this does is it establishes for us the idea that there is a performance requirement for God to accept you. And this performance requirement we call performance-based acceptance. And you can think of it this way. It, it causes us to say, I have to earn whatever acceptance I get from God. That is the mindset of the law. I have to earn whatever acceptance I get from God. And uh, so we tend to approach God this way. Um, and that is that God is an authority figure in our life. He's the one, he's the lawgiver. He drew the line in the sand. And uh, he said, I am in charge. I'm the king. You, therefore, are accountable to me. So there is an accountability that I have to God's authority. And if I am accountable to that and I don't step across the line, at least not too often, then he affirms me and says, good job, you didn't cross the line, you know, good job, and now I accept you. Right? That's the foundation the law state, you know, lays out for us on how do we get acceptance with God. We approach him as the, uh, the, the authority who is... Uh, to whom we are accountable. If we uh, do well and perform well, he affirms us, says, good job. He says, now I can accept you. You know, come into, my, come into my presence now that you've done well. So this, this foundation is, 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 is what the law does. Can you see how that creates a performance-based pattern for acceptance? And what I found is that, especially in America, where a lot of people have grown up in and around church, where there's a, been sort of a Christian cultural Christianity, uh, that, uh, that the churches in America, especially back in the day when everybody went to church and it was just a foregone conclusion, they, uh, they sort of stopped preaching salvation by grace and they began preaching performance and, and, and what a, how a Christian ought to live and what their behavior ought to be like. And I think especially as, as cultural Christianity grow, grew, we got more and more of this idea that, that God just wants us to be good boys and good girls and he'll accept us if we you know, perform well. But this is not grace. Grace says you know, that Christ is the end of the law for all who believe. Well, if Christ is the end of the law for all who believe, what, what happened to the line in the sand? If there's no law, is there a line? I don't think so. Right? If there's no line in the sand, that means I can no longer, I can't go so far that God won't take me back. And I got a lot of people who worry about this. You know, people worry, you know, have I committed the unpardonable sin? Have I gone too far? Have I done too much? You know, but I knew that was wrong even before I did it. It was intentional. How can God possibly forgive me? And, and there's a lot of people question this, but you know, they're still thinking in terms of law. There is no line in the sand if there's no law. Now, the Bible tells us the law is good, the law is perfect, and the line that was drawn in the sand was fine where it was. There was nothing wrong with it being there. And the truth is that when we cross that, there are consequences in our life. You know, and we'll see that especially when it comes to spiritual warfare. Demons love to claim permission to harass people for crossing the lines that God has laid out there. And there are consequences that we live with, but one of the consequences we no longer live with is condemnation. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And what that means is that there is no line here that if you cross that line, now you get condemned. And that is the, uh, the, the, the foundation here. And so God comes to us in grace, and he takes this whole pattern and flips it on its head so that he begins by saying, because you are in Christ, I accept you. I accept you as one who has been washed clean by the blood of Christ, who has been sanctified by the Spirit, you know, who has been adopted in my family, you were accepted simply because you were in Christ. He says, I affirm you as my child. I affirm you as one who belongs to me. You've been bought with a price. You're no longer my own. And he says, I just want to affirm that you've been made in my image and I love you. And then he goes, now I ask you to be accountable to, the, you know, to what I ask you to do. There is an accountability here, but it's coming out of relationship, not to earn relationship. And uh, he said, I, because, and you have to be accountable because I am the authority. But you see the, the difference, all the difference that that makes? If we come on the basis of acceptance and that nothing that I do can cause me to, uh, to lose that connection with God, that none of my sin is going to be so great that the atonement won't cover it, it changes everything. 
So with that in mind, let me show you this verse from Titus chapter 2, verse 12. And this verse says, I got to start big blank up there, right? It says, blank teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly uh, passions. So here's the question. Which word best fits that blank, law or grace? Yeah, when I first look at this, I'm thinking, well, law teaches me to say no. In fact, it comes right out and says, say no to ungodliness and, and, and worldly passions. But the answer is, Paul wrote, grace. That grace teaches us to say no to godliness, ungodliness and worldly passions. So here's my question. How does grace do that? I understand how law does that because law just writes it out. Say no to this. But how does grace do it? Well, three ways. Number one, grace brings us into relationship with God. And in relationship with God, by giving us access to God, it says that we become the bride of Christ. This, for those of you who are here tonight, I don't have it in your notes. We'll have it later for those of you who are looking. All right. The, uh, I just wrote this up today. So the... Uh, the relation, when we get in, become saved, when we enter into, into uh, Christ, we now have a relationship with God where we're called the bride of Christ, right? So in a sense, we have gotten married to the most wonderful person in the universe. And now that I'm married to the most wonderful universe, person in the universe, God says, I want you to live, let me love you, and I want you to love me in return. However, the world is out here, and I think of the world as sort of like Satan's mistress, and the world likes to flirt with us and to seduce us and to try to get us to think, hey, you know what, you're hanging out with the wrong person, man. I'll show you where you know, the real fun is at. I'll show you where the real action is at. And so what happens is that grace says, because you're in relationship here, you should say no to the world. Don't be flirting with the world. Don't go commit adultery with the world. You're now, you know, already in a relationship with the most wonderful person in the universe. So grace, by bringing us into that relationship, it tells us to say no to ungodliness and to worldly passions. That's one. Two, it gives us a new identity. Grace says you are a child of the king. You are a citizen of, the, uh, of heaven. You have been adopted into the family. You have been washed clean you know, this is, this is who you are, and because this is who you are, you are no longer a sinner, you are now a saint, and because of this, sin is beneath you. It isn't like you to sin. You may still have these urges, you may still have temptations, but it's not coming out of your true nature, because your true nature now wants to do the right thing. Isn't that what we see described in Romans 7? I want to do the right thing, but I'm always falling and doing the wrong thing. It's like there's a battle within me because it's like sin is living in my flesh and it's waging war against the law in my mind, which knows the right thing to do, but doesn't seem to ever want to do it. Well, because grace gives me an identity, this new identity says, hey, leave, leave sin alone, all right? It is beneath you. That isn't who you really are. It isn't like you to give into this anymore. And then the other one is perspective. Grace gives us a whole new perspective on life, and that is it take, by taking away the law, by taking away performance, it's basically saying, look, your life isn't about performing and earning things anymore. Your life is about enjoying things. I said the problem with sin isn't just that it's bad behavior. The problem with sin is that it causes us to walk away from our relationship with God. God hates sin not because... He just gets mad at us for doing it. God hates sin because he knows sin separates us from him. We, we become the sheep that is wandering away and not staying close to the shepherd. And so grace gives, gives us a different perspective on life. And in these ways, grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and establishes a surer foundation for righteous living than the law does. See, the law is all rooted in comparison. What the law does is it's kind of like living with a mirror in front of your face. And uh, so it's like, you know, when I live under law, I, uh, it's about the externals. It's about making the outside look good, especially making the outside look good to other people, just like the Pharisees in the New Testament. So when I am in, uh, live under law in, in today's culture, you might think of it this way. You can, in fact, use the word law to think of three areas in which we tend to compare ourselves with other people. And the first one is looks. 
Okay, and I think that in, instinctively we have within us something that looks at ourselves and looks at other people and says, okay, on a scale of one to 10, how do I compare? Right, we're familiar with this when it comes to looks. Right? They even made a movie about it, 10, right? It's a, there's a whole you know, language around the idea of being a perfect 10. Well, we have all kind of you know, grown up in a culture that says, all right, how do you compare with other people in terms of your looks? And so you say, well, if that person is a 10 and that person is a two, well, maybe I'm a six. Or you go, you know, if that person's a 10, maybe I'm a two. And, and what happens is a pecking order begins to cr be created of who are the good looking people, who are the less good looking people on down. Well, that's one of them. The other one is achievement. So a lot of people find out early in life that the only thing they need to do in order to get acceptance from their peers is to look good. As long as they look good, they know they're gonna be accepted. But some people figure out pretty early on, you know what, looks aren't going to get it done. <laughs> it's going to take more than my good looks if I'm going to be accepted by my friends. And so they give themselves to achievement. They try to do great things. They try to, you know, accomplish great things. So they're driven in athletics or they're driven in academics or they're driven in some other type of performance. And their goal is, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how much have I achieved? And uh, another common one is the area of wealth. How rich am I? <laughs> And so we tell people all the time that if somebody has good looks and they are high achievers and they're rich, well, they got it made, don't they? They are always going to be at the top of the pecking order. This is the world system, okay? And what happens is the world uses this, the, the devil uses this system to give you an identity based on your flesh. And that is we can have an identity based on the flesh, and that's kind of what the law does. Is it, it's, it's, he, the, the devil uses the world and to, to say, okay, well, you're, a, you're an eight, you're a five, and you're a three, you know? <laughs> so you're somewhere right here in the middle. Or, you know, you're way up here. And, and, and what happens is from junior high on, we all kind of figure out where we are in the pecking order, don't we? You know, I'm in the in crowd, I'm not in the in crowd. I, I'm a part of this, well, I'm not. And, and, and as a result of this, we learn to compare ourselves to other people and we take our identity from comparison. Well, this is exactly what law does, and this is what the Pharisees did in the first century, and that is that they compared themselves to other people, didn't they? So, well, I'm more righteous than this person. God, I thank you that, you, you know, that I am not like this person, you know, then I give a tithe of everything that I do. And they were constantly comparing themselves to other people, and uh, they knew exactly where they stood in the pecking order with things. And God says they were totally driven by this. They just wanted the praise of men, you know, God, they just wanted people to lavish them with praise. And that's kind of the problem that we have, that, that when we live on a law foundation, we will always turn to comparison, and we will find ourselves in a, in a pecking order, taking our identity from our flesh. The real tragedy here is that that pecking order often doesn't change when we go to church. Too often, we come to church, and we find the exact same pecking order. If you are good-looking and a high achiever with lots of money, you are in. And if you don't have those things, you find yourself on the outside looking for a way to connect. Why? Because too many of our churches are building on law as the foundation of their culture instead of grace. And whenever you start with law as the foundation, it will always lead to comparison, which will always create a false pecking order that is rooted on a satanic lie about your true identity. And this is the challenge that we face. We'll come to something like this. We'll hear about our new identity in Christ. We'll hear about grace. And then we go out into the real world. <laughs> and people start saying things about us again. And people start treating us like, the, you know, according to our flesh. And, 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 it, and things begin to fall apart. I remember when I was in high school, I was really struggling with my own identity and my connection. I went in to talk to my dad about this one time. And he, he did something I've never forgotten. He drew a line on a page. And underneath this line, he put two words. On the one side, he put conceit. On the other side, he wrote inferiority. And uh, this really connected with me because I was a high achiever. And uh, so when I was in school, I got elected captain of whatever team I was on. I was president of my class. I got a lot of awards for things. I was a high achiever. And because of that, I sometimes struggled with, you know, people thinking I was conceited. I tried not to be conceited, but I had a lot of people who accused me of that over the years, but I also struggled with inferiority, feeling like no matter what I did, it was never enough. That no matter how much I achieved, it, I could have done better, I should have done better, there was somebody who outdid me somewhere. And so 
I would find myself kind of ping-ponging back and forth between these feelings of conceit and these feelings of inferiority. And I didn't understand what was going on. I was really being torn up. And my dad said, well, basically, son, what you're doing is living with a mirror in front of your face. And that is your life is all about you. And you're, going, and you're looking at yourself and then you're comparing yourself to other people and saying, how do I measure up? And when you look at these people over here, you say, well, I measure up pretty well. Well, guess what that leads to? Conceit. But then I look at these people over here and I go, well, I don't measure up very well. Guess what that leads to? Inferiority. He says, both conceit and inferiority come from the same source, and that is that your life is all about you. And you were looking, you know, totally at yourself. In fact, when I talk about inferiority, I always think of this one t-shirt that I saw. Maybe you've seen one like this. Uh, the front of the t-shirt says, I have an inferiority complex. And when you walk away on the back, it says, but it's not a very good one. Yeah. <laughs> Some of you will get that later. The, uh, <laughs> so here, here we have... But inferiority conceit both come from the common source of, of thinking about myself, having a preoccupation with myself. So what he said, on the other hand, God has, the, the conceit and inferiority are counterfeits of God's true virtues. And God's true virtues are confidence and humility. It says in confidence and humility only come when we throw away the mirror. That is when we stop making life about us, stop making about comparing ourselves to other people, wondering how we fit into this pecking order. As we throw away that mirror, he says, we need to look at God and take our sense of self from God. He says, when we look at God, we learn a couple things. Number one, God says, you are dust. <laughs> well, he says, if you're dust, do you have anything to be conceited about? No. He says, any intelligence you have, any academic ability, any uh, uh, athletic ability you have, Excuse me. It's all a gift from God. So if you're dust, that leads to humility. You say, I've got nothing to be you know, cocky about. But on the other hand, God says, I love you so much, I was willing to send my own son to die in your place. If God were going to write a check for your self-worth, it would be written in the blood of his son, Jesus. He said, so when we look at God and we forget about ourselves, why well, have confidence that, you know, God loves me, I'm taken care of, I don't have to worry about where I stand. I also have humility because I realize that in God's sight, I haven't earned any of this. It's all a free gift from him. And that made a profound impact on me. I remember the next day I went to school and it was almost like somebody had taken blinders off because before when I went to school, I'd gone there with fear. I would see people and I would wonder what they were thinking about me. <laughs> But the next day when I went to school, guess what? It was in the forefront of my mind is, I wonder what needs they have. I wonder how I could be helpful to them. I'm fine. I'm a child of God. Everything is good on my end. I wonder, you know, I wonder how, you know, what I could do to show love to them. Because grace sets us free to be loving to people by getting the preoccupation with ourselves gone. And Max Lucado uh, wrote a story about this that I found very uh, uh, insightful. It's called uh, You Are Special. He's got a series of books built on here um, about a, a group of little wooden people called Wemmicks. <laughs> and uh, I, maybe you're familiar with this. These little wooden people, uh, all day long they go around doing the same thing. And basically that was they would either put black dots on people who messed up or that were you know, something that was not good about them, or they would put gold stars on them. So if you were a particular shiny attractive, you know, Wemmick with a nice coat of gloss on you, gold stars, gold stars, oh, that's great. If you were a fast Wemmick, you know, you could jump really high, gold stars, gold stars, right? If you were the mayor, you know, status, you'd get gold stars. But if you tripped and fell, all oh, black dots, black dots, you know, if you were, uh, had chips in your wood or whatever, black dots for you, you get the idea. We got black dots and gold stars. So, as the, uh, one day, there's a, a particular Wemmick, his name was Punchinello. And Punchinello, poor, poor Wemmick, just did not get a lot of gold stars. In fact, he mostly got black dots. And finally, the day came when he said, what's the point of even going outside? Nobody's going to accept me. Nobody loves me. Nobody wants to see me. I'm just staying indoors. And so that began a pattern for him. He just started kind of avoiding people, living quietly to himself. And he would do his dishes and look out the window and watch the world go by. And one day something happened. It changed his life. A little girl, Wemmick, went walking by the window. And what was amazing about her was she had no black dots and no gold stars on her at all. And for a moment, Punchinello forgot himself. He went running outside and he stopped her. And he said, what's your secret? 
She goes, what do you mean? He goes, how do you keep people from putting dots and stars on you? She goes, I don't stop them. They put them on me all the time. He goes, well, where are they? She says, they fall off. How do you do that? Is it some kind of special paint? You know, what are you doing here? And he goes, and she pointed to the edge of town. She says, you see that house on the uh, edge of town up on the top of the hill? So that's where Eli lives. Eli's the carpenter who made all of us. He says, every day I go up there and I hang out with Eli, and he tells me how special I am to him. I think you should try it. I got Punchinello's curiosity, but he said, you know, I'm not a very good Wemmick. I doubt Eli would want to see me. He says, maybe after I get my act together. But he went back inside, but now he's thinking about it, and a couple of days later, he decided to take the trip up the hill and go see this place. And he went up to the hill, and he got to the house, and the furniture was huge, like a giant lived there. And he's looking around, and he's amazed at everything, and all of a sudden he hears, Punchinello! He's like, whoa, you know my name? He goes, of course I know you. He says, I made you. I've been waiting for you to come up and visit me. And they sat down and they began having a talk and a nice talk. And by the time they were done, Punchinello found that he was full of joy and he was full of happiness and said, this is great. And Eli said, I hope you'll come back and visit with me again tomorrow. He says, I want you to know you're very special to me. And as Punchinello walked, was walking out the door, he looked back at Eli and a black dot fell off for the very first time. I love that story because it's a, it's a reminder to us that we all have a choice in life, and that is, are we going to accept the identity that Satan wants to give to us via the world based on our flesh and our performance? Or are we going to accept the identity that God gives to us as his children? If we accept the demonic counterfeit and we build our lives on law, we will be trapped on a treadmill of performance for the rest of our lives. And that treadmill of performance is guaranteed to wear you out. And you are going to give up because nobody can ever be so good that they are sure that they have pleased God. And so we get caught in what Jeff Van Vonderen has called, you know, the, the, uh, the try hard, try hard, give up cycle. I try hard, I try hard, but eh, I just don't seem to be able to get there and I give up. It's a cycle of shame that we get on when we live on the basis of law and have performance-based acceptance as the foundation of what we do in life. So in our next session coming up, we're going to be taking a look at, at what is this new identity that grace gives us and how does this new identity make a, uh, a profound impact in the way that we live. 